Guys, I've told my horror story before uh, with S Corp clients and how did how do you know what reasonable comp is? My horror story is when they went after that CPA who was a friend of mine for $125,000 arguing that he knew and that he knew better and that he should have made sure his clients took reasonable comp. I'm a huge fan of RC reports. RC reports, it, it's about $1,400 a year. We're charging the S Corps to come to us under audit. $750 a piece, we'll probably make between ten dollars and $20,000 with RC reports. But if you have S-Corp or C-Corp clients, they have to each year get a report. And the report is as simple as possible. RC reports has a huge database of businesses. It will give you a report that you can rely on. And so far to date, when we produce that report, not a single auditor has challenged it. The critical thing right now is for your clients to get that report to support the number they're taking on the return that you're taking on that return that you're signing. Best way to do it, RC reports. Go check it out. Okay. You can find them. It's trn.rcreports.com. Again, trn.rcreports.com. Go there. You'll save $100. It will change your practice. We create an annuity stream for you and bulletproof your clients' corporate returns. The Tax Rep Podcast is now proudly partnered with Nice Job, the experts in reputation marketing. Reviews are so important for attracting new clients. Before Nice Job, I would ask people to leave reviews, but they would usually forget. And I didn't have a way to stay on top and remember to follow up with them. That's where Nice Job comes in. Their smart follow-up campaign recognizes who hasn't left a review yet and automatically sends carefully timed reminders that can increase your chances of getting a review by 300%. I tried Nice Job for Tax Rep and it's been a game changer. We added 33 five-star reviews in our first month and our Google business profile is like a magnet for new customers. You can try Nice Job for free for 14 days and get 50% off your first three months by visiting nicejob.grsm.io slash tax rep. Nicejob.grsm.io slash tax rep. I'm going to put a link in the description of the podcast. Try it. It will be a game changer for your business as well. How do I manage my tax rep practice? How do I get transcripts? How do I track every, what is going on with the IRS with every single one of my client cases? How do we complete the offer forms, the powers of attorney, everything? We use Tax Help Software. Tax Help Software is the cornerstone of our practice. We use it for its intelligent ordering. Every single night, it will update the transcripts on our clients. So we will see things happen long before those letters even go to the mail. We can then you know, react. We can let the client know. We can get all the transcripts we need to determine what our client's best options are, when is the uh, debt going to expire, and we can fill in all of the IRS forms and get them filed accurately, the analysis done correctly. If you're interested in giving it a test, go to taxhelpsoftware.com, use promo code TAXREPTRIAL, all one word, all caps. You will get a two free two-week trial. Again, that's taxhelpsoftware.com. Tax Rep Trial, all caps for a free two-week trial. If you love it and want to buy it, use Tax Rep 10, capital, all caps, T-A-X-R-E-P-1-0, Tax Rep 10, all caps, one word. You'll save 10% on your purchase. It will, it will be the engine that runs your tax rep practice, just like it's what we use for ours. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on this week's Tax Rep Network podcast. I am Eric Green. Uh, we have a very special guest on uh, this week. Uh, joining us is Rocco Stecco. Rocco is the Acting Director for Small Business Self-Employed Divisions uh, for Collection Policy. Um, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and so um, just a little bit, uh, if you've not uh, met Rocco or know about him, uh, he actually started with the FBI in 1984, which, by the way, I want to talk about because I actually applied to the FBI 
out of law school, um, which, which is interesting, joined the IRS in 1988 as a revenue officer, uh, has held positions uh, in headquarters as a policy analyst, headquarters program manager, director of campus collections in Philadelphia, director of specialty collections for the insolvency unit. That's for taxpayers um, generally who have gone bankrupt. The insolvency unit deals with those taxpayers uh, in terms of collection you know, cl you know, claims, you know, all of that. Um, and obviously now is the, uh, as we mentioned, the acting director uh, for collection policy. Rocco, thank you for taking the time to do this. Oh, good morning. And thank you, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk with you today. Um, so when you went to the FBI, I assume it wasn't as a special agent, was it just as a staff? Yeah, actually, I started um, I was in college. I started with the FBI as a fingerprint examiner. Um, from there, I went into an internal security type position, uh, ended up going to the academy. And uh, my last position there was as a, a um, counterintelligence uh, surveillance person. Ah, uh, no. I am. Um... So I grew up with two guys. Uh, one of them actually has been on the podcast uh, who are now former Navy SEALs. I kind of wanted to um, follow them, uh, but went to college to play college football, uh, was an accounting major, decided accounting is not for me, went to law school. Um, and at the, I got I applied to the FBI. I applied to um, Secret Service and also um the uh, Naval Jack uh, came recruiting and uh, none of them would work all because uh, my eyesight, I could not be a special agent. A secret service would not take me. Um, and, and I understand why, but um, the funny one was the Jag Corps. Um, you know, they said, you know, I said, well, what, what happens when you join? They said, well, look, I mean, you're lawyers you're in Newport, you get up, you run around on the beach for a little bit in the morning, and then you're in class all day learning about military law. And I said, well, once you get through that, can you like go to like other schools or programs in the Navy? And then he's like, like, like what? I'm like, can I go to Bud's? He's like, which is basic underwater demolition seal training. He's like, no, <laughs> no you can't. <laughs> what, 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 first of all, why would you want to? And I'm like, well, I have two buddies of mine. They're Navy at the time. They're Navy SEALs. He said, "Look," he said, "You want to go be a Navy SEAL? Go get in the pipeline to be a Navy SEAL. But we're not going to bring you in, train you in for the JAG Corps as an officer to let you go over to Buds and and, and you know it's not like a weekend warrior program, right? I and mean, if you want to go be a Navy SEAL, and then there's this pause, and he said, "I can save you the trouble right now with your eyes because you had to fill in the form with your eyesight. They won't take you. You're not eligible." So, yeah, that was the end of that. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. it was, a, you know, it was a, one of those once in a lifetime opportunities to join the FBI. I was in my 20s and uh, that being a great opportunity. Uh, that was, you know, the start of my career with the government and got to do some really interesting things there. And then uh, I was there for four years and uh, offered another opportunity to come actually back to Pennsylvania, where my family is, to work for the IRS. And uh, at the time, my children were very young, so we thought that was a great idea. And actually, I'm glad I did. Um, you know, this has been a great career for me, and uh, I really like what I'm doing, and I believe in what I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, it all worked out really well for me. Yeah, no, and I have to tell you, it's, um, I think, and, and I'm not in government, I think it is a really interesting time. Um, I've had Damon Rowe, you know, who's since retired out of the government. He's now at Meadows College, but Damon was the director, the first director of the field of uh, the uh, fraud enforcement office. And we were talking about with data and AI and all the ability to match, you know, people that have filed for bankruptcy, but didn't disclose foreign assets, didn't disclose virtual currency. Um, I think it's a really interesting time, uh, I would think to be in the government now versus, and you can correct me, but 20 years ago with the, with, as an RO, we basically went knocked on doors, which, which Ed, we're going to get into has now changed as well. I, I just think with technology and everything, I, I imagine it would be fascinating. I, 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 I've had Chief Lee on for criminal and it, it, he said the same thing between 
all of the stuff internationally combined with their ability now to go through mountains of data uh, and, and, and to really see everything is um, uh, it's, it's interesting times. Oh, it sure is. It's exciting. It's fascinating. Um, just as you said, when I started as an RO in the eighties, I had a, uh, you know, manila folder paper case file that, that I carried around with me. And, uh, you know, from there we progressed to laptops, which at the time was state of the art. And now here we are today, leaps and bounds ahead of that. Yep. And it, it is very exciting. Yeah, no, no. Um, and, and so um, to, to, for, to bring everyone up to speed, in June, um, I spoke at NYU um, uh, with Nikki Johnson. Nikki is the director of campus collections uh, out, of, out of Atlanta. Um, and she had sort of given us an update. Uh, since then, there have been a lot of changes uh, with the government. Uh, and so what I'm hoping... Um, Rocco, if you could bring us up to speed on both um, uh, the changes from the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but you know also the um, uh, the the the, the um, strategy, the the uh, strategic plan for IRS, and sort of how that implementation is going. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, you know, obviously there's a good chance that that everyone's heard of. Uh, IRS speakers talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and our new strategic plan. And, and we're all very excited about the plan and the incredible opportunity that the Inflation Reduction Act provides uh, to transform the IRS and SBSE. So our strategic operating plan uh, was released in April. It focuses on transforming the tax agency and dramatically improving service to taxpayers in the nation. The future of the IRS that emerges from this plan will deliver a taxpayer experience that will dramatically improve service and at the same time provide tools necessary to improve our compliance activity and support the nation's tax law. Uh, the, strategic, or the strategic operating plan uh, is organized around five main objectives and those objectives are uh, dramatically improving services to help taxpayers meet their obligations quickly resolving taxpayer issues when they arise, a focus on expanded enforcement on taxpayers with complex tax filings and high dollar non-compliance in order to address the tax gap. Uh, and, and as you said, uh, delivering cutting edge technology, data and anal analytics that'll help us operate more effectively and also to attract and retain and empower highly skilled diverse workforce and develop a culture here that is better equipped to deliver results for taxpayers. So over the course of the next 10 years, uh, specifically for SBSC, our improvements will include expanded online service tools, additional ability to respond to notices and file online, simplified mobile friendly forms, expanded digitalization to eliminate paper-based processes and expand service options. So as last year's filing season began, the IRS made the decision to pause billing notices and many of its collection programs in order to focus on reducing the backlog of unprocessed returns and correspondence. In February of 2022, the IRS suspended issuance of over a dozen balance due and unfiled tax return notices. And the IRS also paused its automated and systemic collection programs. We did continue to issue notices that are legally required, such as the first notice, uh, which would be the CP14, the initial balance due notice and demand. Now, our, the, the notice pause itself didn't prevent normal account actions, such as uh, the ability for taxpayers to resolve their accounts through either full payment or short-term payment plans or installment agreements or offering comprom compromise, determinations, bankruptcy or litigation. Um, but, but you know, understanding that notices serve an important customer service function, uh, we're excited to get underway with the uh, resumption of no notices. And uh, specifically right now for people who filed their tax year 22 return uh, with an unpaid balance, they would have received their first billing notice. I mentioned the CP 14. Uh, back in June, 
Um, so those notices have gone out. And as I said, they are, that's the first notice and, and that's the statutory notice. Uh, most other of our collection notices that I, I talked about were paused. Um, and we are now discussing plans to begin to resume uh, issuance of those notices. But the notices themselves that will be going out, um, the taxpayers will see and practitioners will see, um, actually really exciting because, you know, we talked a little bit about technology and improvement of technology, but we've improved our notices significantly uh, to help taxpayers. Uh, most of our notices now uh, will contain a QR code um, where taxpayers can, using their smartphone, uh, take a picture of the QR code and be driven to to our online services, such as an online account, uh, applying for a payment plan, uh, an online payment agreement, or even contacting the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Uh, another... Uh, no, so, yes, so, sorry. So, so the folks who filed 2022... Balance due, balance due notices, like you said, have to go out, you know, um, just by statute. W those folks will actually see the enforcement notices first before any of the people that had balances before that um, whose cases were effectively suspended during COVID. Yeah, so the plan would be to kind of continue the natural progression there first, um, you know, with collection notices for those folks who just recently filed. Uh, so that would be the starting point of our plan uh, when we're able to uh, actually implement and initiate. Okay. And we're, 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 we're working on that now. Um, you know, we're working on the timing of it. We're working on the cadence of it and hope to have some news very soon, uh, you know, as far as when we will actually be resuming notices. Right. No, I mean, because that that's the big question that we're getting a lot of is, you know, oh, and, and from what happens from a, from a practitioner's perspective, you talk to the client and the client ultimately says, well, why should I do anything? Right. I mean, they're not bothering me. The 10 year statute is running. You know, I'm going to do nothing. Let's wait and see. Maybe, maybe you know, there's, they always hope that maybe they'll fall through the cracks. Now, you and I know that it's not going to happen. We're just waiting on this. But it's it's very difficult now to get folks to deal with this when the government's, you know, for so long has not really been taking action. Uh, and I'm thinking more of the campuses. If you're with a revenue officer, they've they've continued their work. But. For those folks with the campuses, um, getting them to come in and do anything, submit a financial, propose an installment agreement, whatever, um, is it's an uphill battle because again, they don't they're not feeling any heat. Right. So yeah, and you know, as as we discussed, you know, the notice pause uh, that was implemented was done for you know a number of reasons. Um, you know, we had significant backlogs in our campuses with processing responses to those notices. Um, it did give, you know, taxpayers, it, it gave kind of everyone the opportunity to take a breath. Um, but but as you said, you know, uh, they haven't heard from us in some time. Uh, so, we, you know, we are excited to get underway with resumption of notices again. Um, we will we'll stage that, uh, you know, that, that'll be a staged approach. Um, so, you know, we can also handle the downstream impacts of, of sending out those notices uh, so we can continue to answer the phones timely and, and respond to correspondence timely. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, again, we'll get the plan is to get underway with, with the most recent uh, Baldu tax returns first. And then from there, um, you know, again, continue in a staged approach then to start reissuing notices. And, and the notices are important um, to taxpayers to, to let them know, you know, what options they have available to them and how we can help them. And, and, and as I said, the notices have been so significantly improved uh, providing taxpayers now with all those options, uh, whether it be um, the QR codes where they can access us uh, immediately from their smartphone and be driven right, right to, uh, to our website, um, you know, we also have now a document upload tool. So if the notice comes out and it's requesting uh, information from the taxpayer, um, again, you know, electronically, they can send us that right from the notice 
they can send us that uh, information that we're requesting. Um, so that'll be a lot more efficient as well. No, I'm, I'm waiting for um, when practitioners can get Dropbox or Smart Vault or whatever, whichever one you want to use so that I don't have to get the stack of mail every day. I could, like the U.S. tax court, I just get an alert when there's something on my case. I just get an email so I can log in and see what it is. That's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I understand. I mean, I've had Paul Mamo on the program. Data security and firewall. I mean, there's a lot there. There are a lot of issues around that. Um, but that's actually what I'm looking forward to is when I don't, we don't have to have literally the stack of mail show up here every day. <laughs> you could just get notified, log in and, you know, see what's going on with all of the accounts under our power of attorney. Oh, well, soon, someday. Um, but, um, how, how is staffing? I mean, I, mean, I know the government has been trying to hire. I don't know. How is that going? So it's actually going really well. Um, we're doing a lot of hiring events across the country. Um, and it's the first time in my career that I've seen us do direct hiring events. In fact, I attended one last or two weeks ago in King of Prussia outside of Philadelphia. And it was a direct hiring event for the IRS. And uh, I went there, you know, basically just to see how that worked. And it was amazing. It, it works really, really well. I, you know, I get to the parking lot of, of the uh, event facility. There's, there were no parking spaces. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in line uh, that applied for IRS jobs. And uh, they walked you through the process from start to finish. And you would walk in the door with your application. Your applicate you'd be qualified, you know, for different positions based on your application. You you, you were interviewed on the spot. Um, you were offered positions on the spot, you were fingerprinted, your photo was taken for IDs. Um, so I stopped someone on the way out and, uh, you know, he was walking out the door and I asked him if he got a job today and he, he was very happy and he said, yes, you know, I did. So I said, tell me, start to finish, how long did it take for you to get a job today? And he said three hours. Um, and that's amazing. Um, uh, you know, what we're doing out there as far as hiring. So yeah, we'll see these hiring events, um, throughout the country now you know we've been conducting those um you know one of the things that i would recommend um if you have any friends or relatives that that have an interest in, in working for the irs uh point them to usa jobs uh that's that's where we post all of our online job listings as well as uh any type of events such as that but yes we have been doing a significant hiring both for field position and campus positions in fact the job fair that for the hiring event that I was went to two weeks ago, they were hiring both uh, field revenue officers, field revenue agents, and and a number of different campus positions. Um, no, it, it is amazing. And for those people listening who aren't never went through this, I remember the day where you would do the application, I think online, and you just wait. You never heard anything. A few months, maybe. Um, I had a friend, it was over a year. So the fact that you're right, that you could show up, go through the entire process and walk out is, is that's actually pretty impressive. You know, when the government really needs people that they, they can, they'll pull it together and get that done. Um, sure. Very incredible. And as you said, you know, it, it was hard for us because just going through those pre-existing normal processes would take months. Um, we would lose people because in the meantime, they would find other jobs. Uh, so now, position, um, you know, where we can do this and offer jobs on the spot, and and we're, we're retaining a lot more candidates that way. Yeah. Oh and no, you're absolutely right. Because while you're waiting, you need a job. So while I'm waiting for the IRS, if something else comes through, an accounting firm, whatever, I'm taking. I'm taking. You know, bird in hand is better than doing the bush. I'm going to take the one where I have the offer now. Um, no, it makes perfect sense. It is cool that you can do that. All of it now, the the back, you know, the fingerprinting and all that right then and there. Um uh you know, I mentioned years ago, and it wasn't so long ago, the RO is going knocking on the door. Um, there was an announcement that um for safe for everyone's safety, taxpayers, IRS uh folks, that most, not all, but most of the um uh 
unannounced. Uh, visits where revenue officers would show up and, you know, at the front door, uh, that most of that has been, you know, stopped. Um, you know, from from your perspective, can you kind of talk about, like, like what do you think about that? You know, is, is this a good thing? Um, I mean, obviously for safety. So when Nikki and I did the talk at NYU in June, we talked about how to tell if somebody's actually an IRS person that shows up at the front door. Um, and then I think it was like two weeks later is the announcement that they're stopping the unannounced visits. Um, so, you know, kind of, if you could talk about, you know, what, what prompted that from your perspective, you know, is it going to have a good impact, bad impact? Uh, and by the way, are there times where there still will be an unannounced visit? Yes. Okay. So uh, to answer the first part of your question, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's it's definitely a good thing for both uh, our you know both the taxpayers, the public, you know, as well as IRS employees. Uh, we changed the policy recently due to you know specifically due to the rise in tax scams and taxpayer confusion, and as you said, over verifying IRS employees' identity, uh, you know, which led to safety concerns for both taxpayers and IRS employees. So. Uh, this is good news. It's good news for taxpayers since they'll no longer be caught off guard and unprepared to discuss you know, the, this this circumstance of the unpaid taxes. And uh, you know, additionally, it's it's a benefit and an improved taxpayer experience when when a taxpayer now receives advance notice and uh, other information in the mail. And as you you and I discussed earlier, um, I you know I, I had been a field RO back in the late eighties and, and early nineties. Um, it's a different world. It's, you know, it's definitely a different world out there. Um, and, you know, you can get caught up in, in a situation uh, catching somebody by surprise, driving down the wrong driveway or knocking on the wrong door. Um, so, you know, it was definitely a safety concern for our employees, but for the taxpayers as well. But, you know, just because of the amount of scams out there, you don't know who's knocking on your door and you don't know, is that really an IRS person? Um, so, you know, this what we'll be doing moving forward is sending out appointment letters and giving the taxpayer the opportunity to respond to the appointment letter, uh, to call in, have a conversation with the revenue officer. Then the face-to-face -face, uh, meeting at that point will be scheduled, whether it be in an IRS office or at a taxpayer's location, um, you know, based on, on a mutual agreement between, between the taxpayer and the revenue officer and, you know, what works best for everyone. You know, and as I said earlier, too, it really gives the taxpayer a better opportunity uh, to be prepared for that contact and be prepared for that meeting. You know, I think overall it will cut down on the number of meetings um, because that first conversation, if we're both prepared with the information that we need, um, that may be the last time you have to meet face to face with the revenue officer. So, uh, again, I think it's good all the way around. It's good for the public. It's good for the service. Uh, it's good for our employees. I think uh, I think it'll make us more effective and efficient as well. Um, the second part of your question with regard to can we ever expect an unannounced field visit by a revenue officer? The answer there is yes, um, but it won't. It, it, that will be the exception rather than the rule. Um, you know, in an event of um, some type of enforcement activity that requires a, a field visit by a revenue officer or a pair of revenue officers. Um, where, you know, perhaps collection is in jeopardy, uh, that may be an unannounced type field visit or, you know, the issuance of a summons. But again, we, you don't see very much of that at all. The majority of our field visits are revenue officers, uh, you know, attempting to contact the taxpayer to help them resolve their account. So the letter that we'll be sending and the letter that everyone can expect if your case is assigned to a revenue officer would be the letter 725B. And, and again, that will uh, establish the appointment and give you the opportunity to contact the revenue officer. Um, we're rebuilding that letter now as we speak to provide you know even more guidance and more information to help prepare the taxpayer for that first conversation, as well as to provide some guidance and information on you know how they can verify that this is actually an IRS letter, and this is an IRS revenue officer. Um, so yeah, a couple things. Um, for the folks listening, in the event you do get someone who knocks, and, and it can be special agents, it could be an RO, 
Um, I would advise if it's you or if it's clients, call the call the police. If there's any concern for your own safety, uh, first of all, do not get a gun and shoot at them. All right. <laughs> Just unless for some reason they're breaking in, that's a different issue. Then they're not a revenue officer. But um, you can always call the police. They will show up. They will confirm that it, the people at the door are who they say they are. Um, so number one, you know, that. Um, Rocco, I know that revenue officers in the past have been urged to at least drive by, see the business, see the house, see what's there. Um, and um, for instance, I know IRS folks have found all kinds of things when they've driven by the boat in the backyard, right? And all, all that kind of stuff. Um, will the revenue officer still go and drive by? And even if they're not going to knock at the door, still look? Uh, or is really most of the field activity curtailed? No, no, the field activity is not curtailed really uh, much at all. Uh, those types of activities will continue. Um, really, the only change here, um, you know, for the revenue officer, for the taxpayer, is just the unannounced visit on the doorstep. Uh, but but ROs will, you know, still be expected to, to view assets and, you know, whether it be visiting businesses or, you know, uh, driving by, uh, you know, residence type locations. Um, that'll still continue. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would guess that um, a lot of that, though, will be, you know, based on a, a conversation between the revenue officer and the taxpayer, whether it be a business, maybe the best place to conduct that first interview is at the business mm -hmm. and we'll continue that. Maybe it is at the taxpayer's residence and we'll continue to do that, um, except we just won't do it unscheduled. Right. No, no, it makes sense. Um, and you're, you're, you know, as far as the ID piece of it, and that's important as well, you know, how do you really know? You know, even if it was pre-scheduled, how do you know this is the revenue officer? You know, this is an actual revenue officer. And revenue officers carry two forms of ID. Uh, you know, they have their uh, pocket commissions as, as well as a uh, an HPSD card, which is a government-issued ID card. Um, and then, you know, we encourage people who may not know the revenue officer uh, or may have a question, you know, is this is this actually a revenue officer? Just to call our 800 number. Um, and you know we're, we're issuing we've issued guidance now where the people answering those phones will be able to direct that call so the taxpayer can actually confirm based on the revenue officer's employee ID and name that this is an actual IRS employee. No, no makes sense. And because my own perspective, the whole world has gone crazy. People turning into the wrong driveway getting shot. It, it's I don't know if it's COVID. I don't know politics. I don't know a combination of everything. Um, but there are a lot of people that seem to have um, be on edge. Um, and more people are armed than ever before. So, yeah, no. Um, where we left off, um, and, you know, so as background, and for those folks who maybe have not listened to the earlier episodes, um, the IRS, when COVID started, may in an attempt to make it easier for taxpayers to um, comply, pay, um, rolled out IR 2020-248. Uh, uh, it made a number of changes uh, in terms of flexibility on installment agreements, rolling in um, new balances into an existing agreement, um, gave people who had and accepted offer a little more time to pay the balance if they were having trouble. Um, you know, Rocco, if we can, you know, in terms of those changes, um, the, and again, I'm, I'm, for the audience, uh, there's a, there was a short, there is a short term installment agreement. So if you have a client that, that, you know, Hey, you know, like Eric, I, I can pay this. I just need like a few months. There was always, it was 120 days. You could just set up an agreement, no financial necessary, no notice of lien would be filed. You know, for those people that just kind of had a blip and, and just needed, you know, that again, 120 days to just pay it and be done. That was extended to 180 days uh, under, you know, on 2022-248. Um, the streamlined, or we call streamlined, the, the installment agreement where you didn't have to provide any financial backing. 
um, with the field continues, I believe, to this day is um, it is um, 50,000 owed or less over 72 months or the time remaining on the collection statute, whichever is less. The campuses at the time were doing a pilot program of 80 of uh, 100,000 or less over 84 months or the CSED, whichever is less. That was extended uh, or, or increased to 250,000 or less over the time remaining on the collection statute. Um, Nikki, in, in, back in June, Nikki had mentioned that those were probably going to be made permanent because right now that they actually had lower default rates and that for now they were going to leave those in place. Um, Rocco, is that kind of still the thinking? Yes, actually, a, a lot of it has actually already been made permanent. Um, for example, and most of this is is campus work, um, you know, or through the campuses. Uh, taxpayers who qualify for a short short term payment plan now have up to that 180 days, and and that option has now been made permanent. Um, you know, in order to resolve their tax liabilities. Um, as as far as you know. Right now, certain or uh, the change that was made at the time was to, you know, to reduce burden. Uh, certain qualified individual taxpayers who owe less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars could set up installment agreements without providing a financial statement or substantiation if their monthly payment proposal is sufficient. As you said, you know that it would cover it within the statute. Uh, that has also been made permanent as well. Um, yeah, so a number of those, uh, most of those have been made permanent uh, as a result it, it, of efficiency, um, you know, as well as taxpayer experience. And uh, it, it worked, you know, it, it was a, an emergency situation during COVID. We made a lot of changes um, because of COVID, and because of the circumstances at the time, but we discovered it worked. Uh, so there was no reason not to make some of those permanent. Uh, taxpayers, uh, you know, with existing direct debit installment agreements, uh, you know, may now be able to use the online payment agreement system to propose lower monthly payments and change their payment due dates. Uh, that was another uh, item that was implemented throughout, you know, throughout that act for COVID. And, and that's now permanent as well. And that's been permanently programmed into the online payment agreement system. Um, so for folk, for folks who have an existing installment agreement that there that that is you know um still um in place if they were to file their 2022 return and there is a balance due again historically the new balance would default and they'd start with collection all over again during covid um you were allowing people literally just to roll that into the existing agreement and continue the agreement um, I thought that that had stopped. Has it? Um, well, like, so for today, if someone filed their return today for their own extension, 2022, they have a balance due, um, would it default the existing agreement or are you still rolling, rolling the balances in? Yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't stopped that. So, um, you know, the IRS will autom automatically add certain, new tax balances to the existing installment agreement uh, for individual and out-of-business taxpayers um, rather than defaulting the agreement, which, you know, obviously can complicate matters uh, for those people, you know, wanting to pay their taxes. Uh, as long as it meets, you know, the the CSED, as long as it's paid within the statute, um, that change has become permanent as well. Um, because my follow-up question was going to be, um, how, I mean, um, Nikki had mentioned, you know, in terms of the 250000 overseas said that that agreement had the lowest default rate, and which is why they, they she believed it would become permanent, um, which I understand, right? For many taxpayers, it creates, it, it gives them more time. It's more flexible than, than, the, um, than, the, than the standards, right? I mean, the housing standards are pretty tight. Um, and so... But the issue with the standards is any kind of a financial blip for the taxpayer, a major medical issue, whatever. Um, there's really very little wiggle room in those agreements. And so uh, 
it doesn't it wouldn't surprise me that the default rate is higher um with the rolling of the of the balances in and and i know i didn't ask you about this so you may not be prepared for this but do you have i mean do you know has has that been working out well i think meaning you're still collecting more than if you defaulted and and now have to have somebody review financials all over again i mean there's a lot there's expense and delay to the government expense and delay for the taxpayer um is have you had do you do you, have you are you aware that the government's looked at that and has any numbers that that it's imp- i'm just asking off the cuff i, I don't know that you do Sure. Now, you know, as far as specific numbers, I uh, don't have those in front of me, but you're right. Um, you know, every time an, an installment agreement defaults, um, it, it costs uh, time and money, you know, to, to reevaluate that installment agreement and reinstate the installment agreement. Uh, it just made sense if, you know, there's a, there's a new liability um, and the payment that's being proposed would still resolve that liability within the statute. Uh, rather than go through that default procedure, having, you know, costing, again, more time and more money to reinstate the agreement, uh, that can be rolled right into it. Right. Um, by the way, I, I, I did find, um, uh, and then, by the way, and then I have a question about insolvency, which I I, I, I meant, I'm meaning to ask you, but um, with offers, and, and for the audience, if you have a tax rate, so if, if you do um, a lump sum offer, what you do is 20% of the amount you're offering goes in with the offer. Upon acceptance, you have five months or less to pay the, the balance. I've actually had taxpayers before COVID call me the last month and I'm I'm not going to have all the money. I've actually found when I've called the offer specialists, they've actually been willing with management approval to work with you. How much more time do you need? you know, another 60 days. Uh, and, and it, which doesn't surprise me because the goal is to get this resolved and out of the inventory. I, I don't think the offer specialists are looking to, def- you know, to default the offer. I mean, that, you know, and I know that they, it was more of an official policy with 2020-248 that they would, that the government would give you more time to pay those balances. Um do, can you tell us kind of where is that from an official policy? Is that sort of still, is there still the urging of showing more flexibility on that? Yes, for sure. Uh, there, there is some flexibility there for uh, someone who submitted an offer uh, who may, you know, temporarily be, be unable to, to make the payment, um, but still has the ability to do so and still intends to do so. Uh, they should engage, engage the, uh, the offer unit. Uh, the offer examiner to have that conversation because some of those flexibilities will still be available to them. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, I actually, I, I actually think all of this is good. Um, now, and you don't, you don't have to respond. I, I've, I've urged um, Leah Colbert to consider the idea of rolling some of that to the field. Um, I know um, that uh, Darren has now retired from IRS, but Darren Guillaume, who's been on the program um, uh, a number of times, Darren's view was the people that are with the field are the worst offenders and they were not going to show any kind of flexibility. Um, I've kind of said, I think you should reconsider that. Um because I, I I think net net we're better off collecting as much as we can um, rather than you know beating people up from months back and forth back and forth you know to try to stick to the standard. Um, I, Leah said she look at it. I, I don't know that there's that actually going to go anywhere, but um, I I think the flexibility the government showed one it was the right time right government shut down economic uncertainty um i think it did i again i don't have numbers but i suspect that it helped people continue to pay who needed to pay and could um but i i'm i'll be curious 
to see if that ends up ultimately going out to the and being adopted by the field. Uh, and I don't know if you you can comment on it or not, but that was my that that's sort of my 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 thought is I think uh, anything that helps people pay, no matter what it is, is still better than not. Um, and so, um, you know, if uh, uh, you know, I, I Darren made his feelings very clear. He he did not agree with that. Um, and so, um, I don't know I don't know where Leah's thinking is on this or yours, but. Um, uh, I think it, it's something that should be considered. Yeah, and, and you know, I, we haven't really, Lee and I haven't really had any specific conversations uh, w with that regard. Um, you know, Dar Darren's statement, it, you know, it still holds true in that the cases that make it to the field um, are probably the most, well, they are, they're the most complex type of collection cases where, you know, that additional, you um, information and and validation is necessary in order to get that solved uh you know i'm not saying that we won't see additional flexibilities in the field in the future uh but at this point that i just haven't had that discussion yet yeah no no fair enough um uh one question i wanted to ask you about the insolvency unit um does the insolvency unit have the flexibility to resolve balances. Uh, I'll, I'll I'm going to, I'll tell you a story. Um, I had a, um, I, I, it was a friend. And this is probably eight years ago. Um, her husband passed away. She ended up filing bankruptcy. The, she, she did have an IRA uh, and she had some equity in the house. Not a ton, but but she did. She had a, probably a thirty thousand dollar IRA, and maybe another thirty or forty thousand of equity in the house. Um, she only owed the government about thirty five thousand, so then there'd be no offer. There was sufficient assets to full pay. Um, she ended up getting uh, hearing from the insolvency unit, you know, at, you know, as the chapter seven, you know, finalized. Um, and, and just for the audience, um, even if the tax is dischargeable, uh, with the notice of lien, you know, the, the I mean, there's still assets that the government can can get at, which is the IRA um, and the equity in the home. Uh, and with the notice of federal tax lien attaches to that, it would ride through the bankruptcy so the IRS can still move to collect. She ended up working out a 12 month, I think it was $500 a month payment to resolve it. And I remember she told me this and I'm like, yeah, that's not the way that, that that's like an offer and compromise. That's not the way it works, but that's actually what worked. She paid the 12 months. I think it took about six or seven months. The, the transcripts were updated to no balance due and that was it. And I, I, I remember thinking, do they have that kind of authority? Um, only because I, you were, you know, you, you were, you know, director over there. What kind of, what kind of authority does the? Uh, let's just and, and ask this. What kind of authority does the insolvency unit have to actually um, resolve a balance? I would have thought they would have forced everything over to the centralized offer. Right. So that what you describe, um, you know, isn't an offer. So. You know, the exempter excluded assets in a bankruptcy proceeding, um, the, the lien would survive and attach to those assets after the bankruptcy was uh, discharged or, or discharged. Um, and then at that point, you know, there would be contact to try and collect on that exempt or uh, excluded asset. So, you know, if the taxpayer did have, at that point, they had equity in their home, um, you know, whatever the amount is, uh, it exceeds perhaps what the liability is. Um, you know, the lien still attaches to the asset. So at that point, it kind of makes sense. You know, if the taxpayer is unable at that point to write a check now for the remaining balance um, based on the equity in the asset, uh, there could be a discussion and there would be a discussion with regard to, you know, how can we liquidate, either liquidate the asset itself uh, to pay the remaining liability or, um, liquidate the equity in the asset, you know, through some type of uh, 
a loan or installment plan, but that it wouldn't be considered an offer at that point. Well, I was just surprised that they settled the debt because my assumption would be, well, the lien survives, though we can't collect against you individual taxpayer. And like we can't garnish wages or whatnot because of the bankruptcy. We can still pursue the assets. And I, I kind of assumed that anything submitted would be funneled through the normal offer analysis based on asset value, 80% quick sale value, you know, all of the usual stuff that we do. So when she said that they just agreed to this $500 a month payment for 12 months, I said, yeah, that's, that's some temporary thing that that's, you're, that, that that's not how this works, but that's how it worked. And I remember thinking, ah, wow, that's actually, now, again, I don't know if the insolvency unit just looked at this and said, you know what, by the time we enforce, collect, for, you know, for, a forced sale, value, maybe they came, they kind of came to a conclusion that that was the best they were going to do. Um, I was just surprised because forcing the liquidation of the IRA alone would have gotten more money. Just cash the IRA. Right. We would have got, I, anyway, I'm just, I just wasn't sure if they have sort of um, the authority to just come up with a deal that they think is best in resolving. Yeah, it's hard to address that one specifically, um, you know, especially not having the, all the specifics of the case. Um, you know, could the if the IRA the, the the IRA could have solved the liability, the remaining liability in its entirety? Um, you know, perhaps there wouldn't have been any type of an agreement then on the equity and the asset. Uh, you know, whether it be another asset, so it's really hard to kind of. Right. I mean, I, it's definitely a case by case scenario. Right. Yeah, um, I'm and, asking you to comment on a case you don't have everything in front of you. No, I I, I understand the time left on the C said maybe so. Um, fair enough. That's it, um, but the fact is that they it sounds like they would at least review all of that, um, uh, and and you could resolve it with them, um, which is which is good to know. Um, so last question, just to, more to more to clarify, uh, Rocco. Um, obviously, the 2022 returns that have come in, balance due notices, the normal process will flow on those. In terms of the the taxpayers with other years back balances, is it safe to say later toward the end of the year, we will probably start to see maybe in waves um, enforcement notices on that start to pick up? Well, what I can tell you is, um, you know, as far as with regard to dates, you know, really don't have that nailed down. Um, you know, we're, we're still kind of building that plan out. Uh, but what I can tell you, and, and collection notices, not necessarily enforcement notices, um, you know, whether it be a, uh, a reminder notice to the taxpayer, you know, that maybe hasn't heard from us in some time uh, to let them know that, you know, to, to remind them of what their liability is um, and then give them, you know, many different ways that they can contact us and solve, solve their account. Um, but so, you know, yeah, as far as the dates, we will do it incrementally. Uh, you know, we will stage it. And, and as I said, you know, the reason for that is just so we can handle the downstream effects internally uh, rather than sending everybody out there a, a balance due notice at the same time. You know, perhaps not being able to, to take all the calls or process all the paper that would come from that. Uh, the plan is just to stage it. It's to stage the release of the notices incrementally that allow us, you know, the opportunity to, to help the taxpayer solve their accounts. So balance due notices will be staged. Date is yet still uncertain, but uh, at some point we'll... I don't know if there'll be an announcement made, but balance due notices will start to go out incrementally with enforcement probably to follow. You, you were just not sure when. Um, right. With that announcement, um, you'll actually see that uh, very soon. That That's the hope. Because uh, we we, you know, we are anxious and excited to get underway and, and re-engage with those folks and, and provide them with the opportunities to solve their accounts. Uh, and, and and I know a lot of people that are anxious for you to start doing that 
Um, we have a lot of people that represent taxpayers who are very frustrated. Again, because I mentioned taxpayers come in and they're not feeling the heat right now. So, hey, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And it'd be, I'm, we're looking forward to when the IRS now, um, uh, even if it's metaphorically, knocks at the door, right? The, 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 the balance due notice is, hey, we have not forgotten you. Hey, why don't you pick up the phone and work something out with us? So we don't have to send you a levy notice uh, later on. Um, right. Now, I, would, I would recommend that you know you you would uh, try and convince you know taxpayers to engage you know sooner rather than later, uh, even if you know they haven't received their notice yet. It's to everyone's benefit. Um, you know, the sooner that they can get their their matter resolved. Well, I agree with you, especially penalty interest. Unfortunately, taxpayers don't seem to, you know, think of it that way. Um, but yeah, no, um, I would urge you the sooner you can start that process of sending out the, the, you know, in waves, the balance due notices, I think the better for everybody. But my two cents. So um, no, um, we're, we're, trust me, we're looking forward to that. Um Rocco, I think that's all I had. I mean, any, any, um, basically any final thoughts for the audience? Again, most of our audience are accountants and lawyers. Um, any advice to the folks who are um, listening to this thinking, you know, this all sounds cool. When are we going to get going? So, Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I would say that, you know, our hope and our expectation is that uh, we are underway shortly, you know, as far as uh, with resuming notices um so yeah I, and again I, you know i can't recommend enough uh you know giving that advice to, to the clients you know with regard to engaging uh the irs you know as soon as they can sooner rather than later um you know it, 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 this is an exciting time you know as we we opened up with you know as far as the technology um that we have in place now and the improved notices and you know the several different now different opportunities or more opportunities for taxpayers to engage with us uh, virtually, um, you know, as opposed, you know, as well as in person. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of changes over the past two years. Um, and, you know, I think the end result will be a better product, a, a better taxpayer experience. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give another pitch. If you have any uh, friends, relatives, or neighbors that uh, want to come work for the IRS, uh, drive them to uh, USA Jobs. No, absolutely. Um... I know both both uh, the civil function and criminal are hiring, um, and uh, I, I agree. Everyone you should be urging clients that do have balances due to actually come in now and 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 start the process now. If for no other reason than if you wait until the the notices start coming out, the phones are going to be more backed up. The mail will get more backed up, even if it doesn't become chaotic like it did during COVID. Um, it'll be a lot easier to deal with the problem now. Um, and so with that, Rocco, listen, thank you for taking the time um, uh, for, to update us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, um, um, you know, uh, we'll drag you back here maybe at the end of the year when, when hopefully the notices are coming out uh, for another update. But uh, otherwise, thank you. Oh, yeah. No, thank you very much for the opportunity to have a conversation this morning. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be uh, happy to come time. So, you know, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, no, and uh, and everyone, listen, thank you for listening in again this week. And um, we'll see you next week on uh, the uh, Tax Rep Network podcast.